I think that today we are honored to be joined by uh, Hibakusha and activist uh, whom most of us know, Setsuko Thalo. And um, uh, she survived the atomic bombing of Hiroshima 76 years ago. She's here with us. And of note is that uh, just one week ago, she was honored uh, with the naming of a new breed, a new variety of the rose flower. So uh, the flower is actually named after her, Setsuko Thalo Rose, and it's a rose of hope. And um, this is actually, uh, this will actually be displayed um, in next month. That is when it will be displayed. It's a rose that does not wither. So yes. Um, so this, it, it was cultivated by Matilda Ferrer, a breeder, a world renowned breeder and president of the Spanish Rose Society. And he describes this rose, the Setsuko Thalo rose, as beautiful, multicolored rose, delicate in appearance yet resilient. So basically describing what Setsuko Thalo is. And um, yes, it, its leaves do not wither throughout the year. So I think this is remarkable. Congratulations, Setsuko. And we are so happy to have you here. And now I'd like to give you this opportunity to share your remarks with us. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I just don't know how to express fully my sense of gratitude for your interest in the issue we are fighting for and to take time to get together, spend moments to support each other and then keep on pushing once again. I am delighted we are working with the younger generation. It's wonderful to feel they are capable, committed younger people there to pick up torches from many of us who are getting a bit tired and a bit weak. So thank you for being here this morning. Um, I don't know where to start. I am almost 90 and reaching the end of my life, I suppose. And a few days ago, we observed the Hiroshima Day, 75th anniversary of Hiroshima Day. Today is Nagasaki Day. Time is passing. Sometimes you're so busy, you forget the passing of time, but it has taken so many years. I think it's important sometimes to stop running to and set the stock of our activities in life. Well, maybe I can take short time to explain so many of the factors, of course, in my life, which affected uh, my life. But of course, as you can imagine, my encounter of a nuclear weapon um, 76 years ago, that definitely did change my whole life. I'll give you a bit of my experience. I was a 13 year old junior high student. And in those days we had no academic uh, program in classrooms. We were all mobilized to do the work for the army, for the government. And um, we were about a group of about 30 girls were selected and trained and to work as a, um, decoding assistant for the army. So I was at the headquarters building on that very day, the building, which was about one mile, um, one mile, yeah, 1.8 kilometer away from the hypocenter. And at eight o'clock, and uh, we started the morning assembly, and the major was giving us the pep talk. The girls, this is a day you should prove your sense of loyalty to the emperor and 
be a good citizen, or something like that. We said, yes, sir, we will. At that second, I did see the, the bluish white flash. It was like a magnesium flash. And uh, that second, I felt that my body was floating up in the air. And that is the end of my memory. When I regained my consciousness, I found myself in total darkness and total silence. And I tried to move my body, but I couldn't. So I knew I was pinned under the collapsed building. So I knew I was faced death. It's in deflection. I, I still don't understand why I remain so calm. I was so serene and just facing death. Maybe neurologists could explain, I suppose, um, what was happening in my brain. And psychologists talked about psychic numbing. Maybe something happened bodily, physically, because I wasn't feeling anything, calmly accepting death. But then I started hearing faint voices, classmates saying, God help me, mother help me. Then all of a sudden, somebody started shaking my left shoulder from behind and said, don't give up, don't give up. See the light coming through that opening. Move toward that way, keep moving, keep kicking, keep pushing. I'm trying to free you. And that's what we both did. And I was able to get out of that rubble. And as I looked back and I saw the building already on fire. So I remembered my friends in that second, but there was no way I could enter back into that burning building. So beside myself, there were two other girls who managed to come out. And the world I saw was something I can't fully describe, but it was morning, 8.15. But when I came out, it was like twilight. It was so dark, perhaps because of the, oh, the, um, the smoke and, so, and the particles in the air, which was rising up together with the mushroom cloud. And that prevented the sunlight. And that must have affected the lightness or darkness of the outside. Uh, then, um, I started seeing some moving objects near me and uh, they certainly didn't look like human beings. They were like ghosts and people's skin and the flesh were hanging from the hands. They raised their hands above the lung and they were slowly shuffling from the center of the city. And um, they were just burned, black and swollen and they collapsed in the middle. And then the soldier said, you girls, you join that procession and escape to the nearby hill. We did. And learning how to jump over the dead bodies. And at the foot of that hill uh, was a large military training ground about the size of two foot two football fields. But by the time we got there, the place was packed with dead bodies, dying people, injured people. But you know, it was the strangest thing. It was so quiet, calm. You would expect in a chaotic situation like that, you would hear people screaming and shouting for help. No, that's not what I remember. The only thing I heard was just a faint begging voices, give me water, give me water. Everybody was asking for water. After all, their body had been um, scorched and, uh, by 4,000 degrees Celsius. I, I understand that's the, the degree of the heat on the ground level. We wanted to be helpful because our injury was light, 
but we had no cups and buckets to carry the water. So we girls went to the nearby stream and washed off all the blood. And um, we just tore off the blouses and soaked them in the cold water. And then we dashed back and put it over the mouth of dying people. And uh, they, <laughs> they just uh, sucking them the moisture from the wet cloth. They looked at you and said, thank you. And then one by one, and they, after they had the drink or something, why they all pass away. Anyway, that's what we girls did all day. I quickly look around in the square at the training ground where thousands of thousands of people were dying. But I didn't see one single medical doctor or nurse. Later on, I learned that about 80% of all the uh, doctors were killed themselves. But the remaining doctors must have been working somewhere else, not where I was. That meant those suffering people had no water and no medication, no care by the professionals. It's just the people who didn't know what to do, but we just responded to their basic needs, which was what. Anyway, that's the way we spend the daytime. When the darkness fell, we girls sat down on the hill and looked down the burning city all night, feeling numbed from the massive death we had encountered during the day. There was no anxiety or panic, oh, what's happening to my house, my parents or anything. No, we remained so calm. That was my psychological state. And that's an interesting challenging issue. I know one American um, psychiatrist did the study how the psyche uh, protects human being uh, in the ultimate situation like that. And Dr. Jane Lifton, some of you may have read his book, Death in Life. Uh, he spent half a year in Hiroshima, interviewed the survivors and um, listened to their stories. And uh, he said he made them many helpful, uh, well, he presented many helpful ideas. And one of the things he talked about, about this psychic numb in the ultimate condition, how human beings behave, how they feel. Well, he talked about the cessation of emotional responses, appropriate emotional responses. We just stop feeling. And that applies to my own memory because for a long time I suffered. What kind of heartless human being am I? I watched my own sister and her four-year-old child being cremated in such a um, primitive way, you know, in the ground, the soldier dug up and their bodies were thrown in, gasoline poured, the lighted match was thrown and they kept turning their bodies with the bamboo holes and saying, hey, stomach is okay, but the brain is not what and burnt yet. They made the cruel remarks like that. There I was, 13 year old child just standing without any emotional responses. I just watched it. So memory of that, troubled me for a long time. I accused myself, I am heartless. I didn't even shed tears. But later on, Dr. Lifton's uh, contribution of ideas uh, was very helpful. Anyway, I'll come back to my story. And uh, on the 7th, the morning of the 7th, and uh, they were, <laughs> crowds of people at the mountain and soldiers said, is there Setsuko Nakamura? Is there Setsuko Nakamura? 
your parents coming. I was surprised and they somehow found me. They heard from other people that I was at army headquarters, so I must be with the soldiers and so on. Anyway, I was reunited with them and I learned and my sister I just mentioned and her child were just read almost close to death and they were uh, resting at the nearby uh, summer house of my relatives. So uh, next day, I joined my sister and a four years old boy and for several days, we tried to care them, but with nothing. And they kept begging the water as they did, uh, yeah, like everybody else. And by the time we had to give some water to that little boy, somehow his face was so disfigured and it was hard to open his mouth. Somehow, forcefully, we, we opened his mouth and tried to give a bit of fluid. Uh, anyway, no medication, no, nothing. At least they had the loving family around, but tens of thousand people just abandoned their families and relatives were searching their loved ones somewhere, but they never met. Anyway, and I, actually, I lost a total of nine members of my family, closest relatives, two uncles, two aunts, two cousins, my sister, sister-in-law and nephew. I told you about my sister and nephew who were so bad, badly burned and they lived several days. But my uncle, who was outside of the city, so he and his wife survived. We rejoiced the news. But then several days later, I heard that they were developing purple spots all over their body. So after my sister died, my parents went to my uncle's place and to care for them. And according to my mother, um, their, their internal organs seem to be rotten and coming out as a thick black liquid or fluid. So they do, they use everything to use as a diapers until they died. We didn't know this condition uh, was caused by the radiation. Nobody knew, even the doctors didn't know what was causing this kind of condition. And some people had fever and the doctor thought, well, maybe this is scarlet fever. So it took some time before we learned what we actually happened, how to cope with this crisis situation. Um, yes, my sister-in-law uh, was a high school teacher. And at, on that day, about seven to 8,000 grade seven and eight students from all the high schools of the city were brought together to the center of the city in order to do some physical labor to clear the destroyed rubbles. Um, the city was getting ready for eventual big air attack by the Americans. So they destroyed houses and somebody had to clear it. So they used the students as the cheap laborers. And so seven to 8,000 students were there. My sister-in-law was there um, supervising the students. And I learned later on, by the time that fireball came down to the ground level, the degree of the heat, of course, was reduced from millions of degrees coming down on the ground level where people were living about three to 4,000 degrees Celsius. That kind of heat simply 
vaporized, you know, incinerated. So from my own high school, 351 people were there. They were all practically killed instantly. One of them survived, my best friend. So she came back to school later on and told us what the situation was like before other girls died. Of course, everybody was just burned, black and disfigured, and they could hardly see each other because their face was just uh, disfigured. But by the voice, they could identify, like this was Miss Sando, Miss Tanaka. And the math teacher said, well, come on girls, let's be together. So people just crawl in the muddy place and then they came together and they wanted to sing him together. And it breaks my heart when I heard this story and when I remember it, they chose their favorite hymn. Here, um, nearer to thee, my God, I come or something like that. It still is my favorite. Well, they thought of it. That's what they sang together. And then my teacher said, the girls who can walk, come with me. Let's walk to the nearby Red Cross Hospital. And those who have trouble hung on, on my shoulder. So Miss Muramoto stood up and put her arm on the shoulder of Miss Yone Kura, Yonehara. And she reported to us that moment, the flesh and skin just came out, came off and she could see the white bone, the shoulder bone of the teacher. Well, they got to the hospital. I didn't know that was a hospital. Mitch's grandfather was uh, lying down with his own injuries, but they got, they got there and Miss Yonehara stayed there for several days, a few days I hear. But of course, hospital was destroyed and the people lying down, not just in beds, but on the floor everywhere. And I hear she just lie down on the ground in the garden, but they got some care. They're doing better than others in the other part of the city. Uh, what else can I tell you? But uh, in the aftermath, the girls who are burned badly were so disfigured and um, they looked rather unsightly to say the least. And um, heartless kids said, oh, you are obake, you are a ghost. So those girls just helped hid themselves somewhere in the house or something. They didn't want to go in the public to be ridiculed and laughed at. My own church minister knew this reality and uh, he worked with uh, Norman Cousins and uh, John Hurst, those people in New York. They uh, created a wonderful program and 25 girls were selected and they were brought to New York to Mount Sinai Hospital and with the support of Quaker people. Uh, they spent several months, I think, and to get the plastic surgery. So they were very fortunate to get that. Uh, well, thank you, American friends in New York area for your support. Not only the girls who benefited, but the rest of us benefited to know there were caring friends, even in the so-called enemy country. People were not enemies, nation to nation, did such cruel thing to humanity. Um, anyway, what I started telling you was about 
social discrimination, which against survivors because of the ugliness and uh, and survivors are tired, very well, not energetic. So people started calling they are lazy bunch. Of course, that affect their employment and all that. And uh, and with the ugly sights you know, on the scars on the faces, the young girls in the mar marriageable ages, and they were so broken hearted because that meant the no chance of happy marriage. That was a real issue. Um, and I can't speak detail of the medical uh, problem, but I do remember that the, there was total lack of medicine and the knowledge of how to deal with the victim of the nuclear uh, warfare. The doctors had to just take a chance to do what, you know, so. When we heard that the United States was going to establish some kind of medical setting in Hiroshima, the ABCC, we called it, uh, Atomic Bomb Casualties Commission. They built the same thing in Nagasaki too. So they thought, oh, we're going, finally, we're going to get some kind of medication. They were happy. But soon we, we were disappointed. The sole purpose of that American agency was to study the effective effect of radiation on human bodies, but not to treat people. Well, you can imagine how the survivors felt. They thought, well, once again, we're being used as a guinea pig the way they use us for the bombing itself, indiscriminate attack on innocent citizens. They were not combatant. They had really nothing to do with the war planning or anything, but United States consciously chose down that location of attack. They didn't want to drop the bomb during the night when people were sleeping. They wanted to use it during the daytime when people were busy to get to their work and schools. People are mobile, busy on the street. And those information comes from the, um, well, there are lots like uh, activities of interim committee or targeting committees and so on. And the President Truman had several key people around him. You know, you know, when I speak in the States, the students ask me, are you still angry at Americans? My response is, no, I have no reason to be angry at people. They were in the dark like the rest of the world as far as Manhattan Project was as far as this planning for the mass killing, how, how to kill, how effectively to kill, how to use that result to prepare for future new war. All this kind of planning went with a small group of people. We, I and many other people consider that was a crime against humanity. So I make it clear to the student, no, people, not people, but those who planned for such inhumanity, inhumane mass massacre atrocity, that is something to be remembered. But we don't remain angry well, everybody felt pain and sadness and anger. And, but when 
you know, we go through the emotional intellectual process. No point in being angry, just would, that would be the, you know, repetition, going the circle of hate, that doesn't solve any human problem. We have to go beyond that. And that feeling of anger can be, can be generated into a new energy, creative, powerful energy to change the evil from this world. So I don't feel embarrassed about talking about it. Yes, I was hungry. That was my honest human response. And I encourage other survivors, don't be shy when you go to stage, when they ask those questions, be honest. Anger is a natural human feeling. If you had it, say so. But you didn't remain. You came out of it. You are driven to do the work to make sure nobody else would ever go through that experience again. Anyway. Um, anyway, let me talk about the turning point for me to really go into public. Um, I finished high school and went to university for four years. And at the age of 22, I graduated from university and I had the opportunity to receive the scholarship to study in the United States. It's because I was so impressed by the remarkable work my church minister were doing and uh, helping the people like uh, the Hiroshima Maiden I just mentioned and helping with the 5,000 orphans, the kids who were relocated out of the city to protect themselves. They were living in a mountain at the Shinto shrine or Buddhist temple and so on because Everybody anticipated imminent attack by American B-29. That's the name for the, the largest flying fortress, they called it. And the war ended, and so soldiers were coming back to Japan. And Japan had already, Japan was defeated, it surrendered, and Japan was under the occupation of allied forces, mainly by the US. In that chaotic situation, one my own minister, one, one of those people who were providing leadership to organize the care for the families with a father, the orphans, and um, the people injured who are not having any medical care, Anyway, I was, as a teenager, I was so impressed by uh, selfless adults around me who were dedicated for the new lives of the citizen. So I wanted to be like him. I wanted to be like other people, helpful, giving people around me. I wanted to become a social worker. The president of the college I graduated from, who is a graduate, of Columbia University in New York. She knew what the situation was. She said, if you want to, if you choose social work, you know, the United States is a good place. They have a good educational program. And go and get the training, come back to Hiroshima. We need you. Now we are living in democracy, no longer in military state, totalitarian society. Woman has a place in society. So you come back and help to get the woman become active in the city. And very uh, helpful advice she gave me. So I came to the States and that was 1954. If you remember what was happening at that time, United States had started testing hydrogen bomb, a lot more destructive bomb than atomic bomb. And then finally, I think it was March 1st, I think in 1945, 
they tested the largest hydrogen bomb at the beginning at all in the South Pacific, Marshall Islands in the Pacific. And this news really upset the entire nation of Japan. They were angry, people were angry. Not just Hiroshima, not just Nagasaki. Now, United States is after the people of Marshall Islands. Enough is enough, this has to stop. The entire nation woke up. And you know, that was the beginning of the birth of the largest social movement recorded in the history of Japan. And that was what was happening in, during the springtime, 1945. And that was a time I graduated from university. I was coming to the United States. I was not exactly totally prepared, I suppose, in that climate. As soon as I got to the States, press people interviewed me and said, what is your opinion? How do you feel about what's happening in Japan, bikini and so on? and uh, fresh out of the college, naively. I gave my honest feeling, that has to stop. United States should not be preparing for future nuclear war by testing. Testing means developing new weapon. That was 1954. That's what we were talking about the need for stopping the testing at that time. Anyway, that happened. And uh, starting next morning, I started getting unsigned hate letters. How dare you? Remember where you are. Remember who gave you scholarship. Go home. That was the beginning of the traumatic week. I just arrived from Japan after spending two weeks sailing the Pacific Ocean. If it was not easy, I would see stay. So I was suffering from this all the time. But anyway, I was excited and happy to come to a new world. And uh, I had a great anticipation of learning, making friends. But I was told to go home. I was frightened, really. What, are the, what am I going to do? I can't go back. How do I survive in this society? I had to do soul searching. Professor was kind. They gave the house to myself all day. I was living in a dormitory, but then they thought it could be too dangerous. I couldn't attend the classes. So I was alone in the professor's empty house. Oh, that was the loneliest time. I have to make up my mind how to live. I was alone. I had no one to consult with. In reflection, I admire myself. Somehow I reached a very good conclusion. I thought, well, if I stop talking about my experience of atomic bombing, who else is going to do that? It is my moral responsibility. I can't pretend I know nothing about it. I do know something about it, how the weapon affect human body and soul and the community that have to stop. So that was really the turning point for me. But also, I responded to the invitation. I spoke here and there. So, 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 so. Okay, okay, all right. Um, anyway, that was the beginning of my uh, activism. And so I went to Virginia, that's where I spent a year. And my husband-to-be came back from Canada and joined me. We got married in Washington, DC and um, entered into Canada. And I did summer study at the University of Toronto. Then after that, I went back to Japan, did some practice of social work and teaching and so on, together with my husband. 
and had two two babies. Of course, having baby caused anxiety because many women who were in the city at that time had uh, you know, um, babies with a developmental delay and uh, mental retardation and so on. So the women, uh, people avoided the women who were in that city. And they said, well, don't, they said to their sons, don't marry those girls. They would have the deformed baby. So that was another reason for, yes, I realized in the shortness of time, I will stop that, but uh, that's part of my life story. And um, I had a great time of learning. I found American people busy, just uh, justifying their government's behavior. It was not easy to work with people like that, to live in that society. But things started changing and we have people like you and million other people. I remember the day million people walked in Manhattan in New York and they all said, never again, no more nuclear weapon. So that's where we are. So let's keep on. I know I get tired too from time to time, but we just can't afford to give this up. We did achieve the first milestone. We now have a treaty which said weapon, those nuclear weapons are illegal, not just immoral. They are illegal. We have to get rid of that. Let's keep working. Sorry, I took a long time. So. When I start talking, I keep on. <laughs> okay, that's it. We'll talk some more later on.